All right, hello guys, this is Terry Christian here and I am here to talk to you about educational games, when to use them, and which ones to use. Um, this is coming to you guys um, specifically mostly for NCI. However, some of these games have great replayability inside the classroom as well. Um, and actually some of or one of them might actually be mostly used for whenever we go back to in-person classes. That being said, before we get started on each game in particular, we need to talk about the structure and framework that we are being asked by the district to look at. Um, a lot of the educational games are going to have their own strengths and weaknesses. I'm going to touch on four of these games or game styles today. Um, but first, the framework. Um, the first part of the framework, of course, is read and research. Um, a lot of games here in the application would be for um, vocabulary, and even then it's not necessarily the strongest at introducing new vocabulary. Usually this would be seen as um, kids reading or doing research in an asynchronous environment, meaning that they are doing it by themselves at home or in the classroom if we go back, and then as, we, as the kids finish with that, you can use it as a synchronous activity to check on their reading and their research. Um, stage two is, or step two, is explore. Um, I've seen this work in select situations. Um, explore tends to lend itself more towards things like simulations or labs or stuff like that, whereas explore has been very successful in a situation with our English teacher. Um, I have seen her teach Logos, Ethos, and Pathos, in which she gives a general explanation to kids about what each of those things mean. And then she had loaded up a lot of different ads, um, both video clips and ones that you would see in magazines or billboards. And the kids, as they played, were being introduced to the idea of, hey, which of these is appealing to me? Is it Logos? Is it Ethos? Is it Pathos? Is it multiple? Is it none of them? What exactly is occurring here? And honestly, it was very efficient with the kids being able to explore these ideas with all the real life examples. Um, stage three of the framework, or step three, however you see it, is collaboration. And honestly, a lot of these really work well on collaboration. One in particular is a lot stronger than the other ones, and we will talk about that as we move forward. However, the downside to that one is, is it's not as good for NCI. Um, stage four um, is the application stage or just the apply. This one is good if you wanna start looking at replacing some of the kids' work. Um, if you were having kids say working on worksheets rather than working on some sort of presentation, then you can use games to supplement those worksheets. Um, it keeps kids more engaged and it's more fun to do that than say just work on this worksheet and, and submit it or work on this Google uh, form and answer these questions and submit it to me. This is more of a um, fun, more engaging thing. The kids believe it's more fun and that there's less at risk for it because when it comes to answering questions on a worksheet or it comes to answering questions on Google Forms, they're immediately thinking about their grading, they're being graded for correctness. Meanwhile, you might just be checking on their progress and using it as formative. Um, stage five is reflection, and this is where a lot of these things shine. You can use these as a way to check on the kid's progress, and it gives you data. On top of that, it gives the kids data and progress on their own growth, because it tells them when they get something wrong, it usually will tell them what the correct answer is, and in some of them, they can see that question again and they could actually get it right the next time. Um, that being said, understanding where we are in the framework, we can now look at the different kinds of games. Um, the first one, of course, is a favorite. A lot of people have used this and there's a lot of introduction to this in the district and that is Kahoot. Now Kahoot is, of course, a game that needs to be played live. So as mentioned here, it is synchronous learning only. I've never actually seen Kahoot be used as in an asynchronous environment because you need to actively see one screen that has both the questions and the answers. Everybody else's screen just has these general colors and symbols. 
Um, I have seen this being used very effectively as guided practice. Um, I've used this in the past for math, where I could put up a math problem, give the kids time in order to solve it and answer. And once that happens, I can check to see how many kids got the correct answer. Now, from there, because you can control the speed of Kahoot, um, whether or not you click that next button or not, I have taken that time to go, okay, kids, we need to talk about um, how we get this answer or why this makes sense. And I worked out the problems or explained the concept to the kids in which then they are able to get the correct answers moving forward. And that way they are getting that feedback of, you didn't quite get it, but here's how to get it. Um, and most kids are very familiar with it. Now, right now, when we talk about the strengths and weaknesses of Kahoot, you guys need to understand probably when to implement Kahoot versus one of these other ones. Kahoot's really good for competitive play, and it's really good for synchronous learning. Um, it's really good about letting kids actively look at it. Um, one of the weaknesses is, of course, because the questions are all presented, at, the same questions presented to all students, it's easy for a kid to be that little heckler and try to start shouting answers or for them to give each other the answers and not actively be um, playing the game for what it is. However, Kahoot also has a really good naughty nickname filter. Um, besides the ability just to kick it out, it already knows some of the combinations kids could put in to try to put up like bad words or inappropriate things up on the board. Um, and you can hide it to where, as you kick them out, kids aren't seeing the names that are actually popping up. That being said, if you really need to lock down your games, and I've done this in the past, you can set it up to where it assigns random names like Blue Squirrel to a kid. And that way they do not have the option to put stuff in because I've seen kids be very creative where they use the Russian alphabet or they use a different alphabet that has similar... It's different in code, but it's not different in appearance. And it lets them bypass and put all kinds of bad or inappropriate words up on the board. Um, again, one of its strengths, you can go question by question and talk to the kids, and most kids are familiar with Kahoot. Next up is GimKit. Um, it's similar to Kahoot, and it is created by a college student, last I checked who is actively using the subscriptions in order to help pay for college. So if you choose to go with GimKit or use GimKit or subscribe to it, know that you're helping a kid in their dreams of becoming a well, college educated. Um, this one is strong because it lets kids answer questions at their own pace. Instead of it being one question presented on the board and here's X amount of time, whenever the game started, it has a a length of time, like the whole game will run for five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever you set it for. Um, every kid who is actively playing is given one question from the question bank with all the answers, and they are playing on their own devices instead of it being one question projected. Um, this gives it a lot of replayability, and it's really strong because kids can actually see the same question multiple times and that reinforces what the correct answer is. And later, when you get the data, you can talk about why certain answers were correct and why certain ones are wrong if you see that the class is having a lot of problems with that. Um, this is one of those games where you can kind of argue that framework one, it could work really well with if you're introducing just vocabulary to kids. That way they are actively constantly looking over the vocabulary. And with this one, the more questions you have, the more diverse question types you might have. But sometimes this one's stronger to not have as many questions because if you want kids to get build their memory up or like build their knowledge on certain words, um, they will see those words more frequently if there's less questions. Because again, it's a random question from the question bank. Um, you can upload note cards and slide decks and they automatically can generate into questions. And that way it is just, which of the following has this definition and you don't have to worry about creating it question by question and it saves you time. Um, a lot of my students were hesitant to play this game at first because they absolutely loved Kahoot. But once they played it, a lot of them wanted to play this over Kahoot because um, part of the name of the game is that you need to get money to buy power-ups to make money faster. And in the end, whoever has the most money wins. On top of that, 
the kids absolutely love the fact that they can sabotage each other. Sometimes you can um, steal money from other players. Um, some power-ups allow you to basically earn money when somebody else earns money, but the class favorite is the ability to freeze. You can choose to um, buy a power-up and you can choose a specific target. It's like if, oh, you're going to beat one of your friends and you really want to get the edge on them, you can buy a freeze and freeze them for 10 or 20 seconds, and then your, um, your friend cannot answer any questions until the freeze is gone, giving you chance to actually move forward. A new feature that I haven't had a chance to check but sounds really awesome is something called Kit Collab. Basically, students are able to submit questions to you for your approval. Now, they don't automatically appear on the game from what it says. It says they send them to you, you read them over, you okay them, and you send them in. This is an extra level of engagement because kids are now actively contributing to the set of questions they see, and they feel like they own part of the game. Um, Again, this is almost its strengths and it's, it's all at once. Um, you can use this as an assignment, which means this can easily become your asynchronous or away from us at home at any given time of the day work. The kids can actively play this game or study the slide decks or the questions themselves while um, they are away from us. And one of the great things about GimKid that I have seen kids complain about Kahoot. There is different game modes in GimKit. Um, there's your regular traditional like Kahoot. You can do your teams like Kahoot, but there's things where like it's boss battle where one person takes on the whole class or there was humans versus zombies where one half of the team or half the class is a human and half the class is zombies and they're trying to buy power ups to get rid of each other. Um, Touching on the strengths and weaknesses of this, I'm going to try not to double up or re-talk about something I've already talked about. Um, the different modes give it a lot of replayability, and therefore the kids can see the questions multiple times because they're more focused on, oh my gosh, let's play humans versus zombies, or let's play boss battle. Like, I'm going to take this person down. Um, and the weakness that I have actually seen is that... Um, it doesn't really seem to have as strong of a naughty nickname um, system as Kahoot does. Kahoot has been around longer, so I think they were able to develop theirs better. And I haven't seen the ability to um, force kids to use specific names, uh, which is something that Kahoot really, really is strong in. Quizzes is one that I am more recently becoming exposed to. I've not been able to use this one in the classroom, but I did want to talk about it anyway as I've been playing around with it. Um, quizzes is basically turning slide decks into games. Um, that way kids can actively go through flashcards and they can study it. And then whenever you play the game later, the kids are able to actually show you what they've learned. It seems very engaging. Um, it gives you a lot of reports and they're they're easy to read and they give you a lot of live data and it almost like it automatically scores you. So it'll say something like this kid got a 67% or this kid got a 92%. Um, and it gives students, and one of the big things that separates this from the other four or the other three that we are talking about today is that every now and again, you'll have, I guess I call them like Phoenix questions. You'll see this little Phoenix symbol appear up on your screen, and it will let you redo a question in the past that you've missed. So it automatically gives that forgiving aspect and tone to the game that allows kids to kind of redeem themselves. And in that moment, it can I feel like it could be very powerful for the kids to reclaim the questions they got wrong and possibly score better on it. Now, one of the, uh, the strengths and the weaknesses, um, this one, just like GimKit, you can assign it as homework. So this can be both synchronous learning of something fun that you do inside the classroom while you're together, um, or on, say, Zoom or whatever you use for um, classes during NCI. But this can also be used for your asynchronous learning where you're working on it alone, or you're, the kids are at home, or they might do it at 2 o'clock in the morning because that's whenever they have a chance to do it. Um, the other thing is, is I've seen this be um, really strong, and I've not noticed this in the other games 
but maybe that's just my mistake or my lack of um, investigation. But you can assign standards to um, the questions so that you can go back and look at which standards do the kids have mastered and which standards the kids do not have mastered. And that way you get an extra level of report. Um, the last game set that we're going to talk about is Quizlet, which is interesting because if I remember correctly, Quizlet was not originally designed to be a game system, but it has the option to. Um, if my research or my experience with it is correct, Quizlet was originally created for to be used as a slide deck um, in which you can use to study, and it has game options now. Um, it seems to be really good with vocabulary. Um, in this instance over here, I'm showing you a different kind of style with science, which is um, it is pointing to different um, systems like the digestive tract or the respiratory system, digestive system, endocrine system, whatever. Um, and it's having kids actively look at and engage in what that would be. Um, that being said, you notice that it has three different modes to play. Um, Two of the modes, the kids play by themselves. Match, of course, is just like any match game. You match the definition to the actual um, vocabulary word. Then there's gravity, where you can have the definition falling from the sky, and the kids have to type in the word before it hits the ground in order to survive. <clears throat> but the other thing is, is that it has a very, very interactive collaborative mode that I've not seen in the other three. Um, it is probably the most collaborative. Um, and as I move forward, you'll actually see what it looks like. Um, this one probably lends itself more to a traditional classroom environment, but with our use of breakout rooms, I could see this being used during NCI. Um, with Quizlet, Quizlet Live, um, it's collaboration mode or this game mode. Um, not only like it will put kids on teams, and then within those teams, the kids, those teams will get the same question. So everybody's phone or everybody's Chromebook will get the exact same question as everybody else on their team, except all the kids have different answers. Um, and it is up to the kids to discuss, this is the correct answer, who has it? Because only one of the teammates has the correct answer. And if anybody else on the team starts guessing or clicks a different or the wrong buttons, the whole team just got it wrong. And as you see up here, um, the teams are competing as a whole. So when this game goes live, the kids have to actively talk about what's the right answer, where's the right answer. And so that way you can, um, you can kind of group kids differently, like you can put your strong kids together, or you can do intermixed groups where you have some of your stronger kids working with some of your weaker kids in this area or this content in the moment. And then that way they can help kids kind of figure out why this is the correct answer. And actually sometimes, You'll also see kids like arguing or talking about um, what's the correct answer and why, and that's actually a very meaningful in the middle of a game. Um, the other strengths and weaknesses that I have not touched up on, um, this game, this also has different features than just flashcards. Um, this also has the ability to like have kids practice writing the word, have kids practice spelling the word, and it has a test mode where the kids are actively able to go in and kind of answer these questions without it being a game. Um, the other thing is, is it seems to group students for you, and I haven't noticed, or I haven't, I guess maybe this is just my um, inexperience with it, I don't know if you can actually make the groups yourself, which could be a weakness because there are certain kids that you don't necessarily think need to work together and the game could automatically group them together. But like I said, this is a very strong collaboration um, and I find it very helpful for kids, especially whenever they want to work together. Um, that being said, as we move forward um, and as we end this session, I want to make sure that we revisit the framework and that we understand. Each of these games are strong in their own right. Which one to pick seems to be by personal preference and what you're doing in the moment. Kahoot's good for like in-person, nope, um, more of an active like everybody's there. You can just project your screen and everybody can have fun with it. Whereas GimKit and Quizzes are really good about being played outside the classroom. Um, GimKit and quizzes, 
appear to be really strong. Well, Gim Kit's really strong because kids are able to see different questions and they are more so focused on themselves rather than the one question on the board with all the answers that they may or may not be able to see and you may or may not have a heckler in the back shouting, the answer is red. Um, many students are also going to be able to enjoy having the asynchronous part. Um, it's more like an active worksheet in a way because it will let kids know when they get certain things wrong. If you use GimKit or quizzes, the awesome thing about quizzes is that it, again, it gives kids that chance to actually get the questions right. Um, on the framework, or going back to the framework, these games seem to hit framework three and five very, very well. Um, Framework three being collaboration, or the kids need to collaborate, it does have a sense of really strong teamwork and all these games can be assigned as a team. Also stage five with Reflect, students are better able to um, understand their knowledge and we are better able to understand their knowledge and where they are based upon the questions inside these games. Um, I did notice that all four of these seem to be um, very easy to make. Some of them are easier than others, but they have the share feature where you can share them to other people in your department or people in other schools, which saves us all a lot of time. So um, thank you very much for watching this. Um, this is, my name is Mr. Mr. Terry Christian, and I, Hope you guys have a great one.